This is the world's most mysterious book, the Voynich Manuscript. Imagine stumbling upon an ancient tomb, its pages filled with enigmatic symbols and strange illustrations, plants that defy botanical classification, astrological charts with unfamiliar constellations, and old forgotten recipes that seem to hold the secrets of alchemy. This is no fiction. This is the mysterious Voynich Manuscript. Named after the Polish book dealer who brought it into the spotlight, and now resting within the vaults of Beinecke Rare Book and Manuscript Library, this mysterious book is a linguistic labyrinth that still cannot be translated. What hidden knowledge could it contain? Who wrote it and why? Could finding its secrets change our understanding of history, science, or even the mystical world? We'll find out in the new episode of Secret Origins. Welcome! The Voynich Manuscript is a one-of-a-kind book from the 1400s that has puzzled people for years. It's full of bizarre drawings, from plants that don't match anything we know, to tiny figures using strange machines. The text is even more mysterious, written in a language with its own unique alphabet, and rules that no one has been able to understand for sure, though some say they have. This book is probably one of the most talked about in history, with endless theories about what it means, where it came from, and why it was made. Officially called Beinecke MS-408, it got its more famous name from Wilfred Voynich, a collector who bought it in 1912. Now, it's kept at Yale University's Beinecke Rare Book and Manuscript Library, and is hardly ever shown to the public. However, you can see a digital copy online, if you ever get the chance to see it in person, it might seem small and worn out. But inside, it's packed with fascinating drawings, all mysterious plants, star maps, and women in strange poses. The book's filled with writing that fits around these pictures. But here's the kicker. No one can read it. So, who wrote it? What was the purpose of it? And how did Wilfred Voynich come across this mysterious manuscript? Wilfred Voynich, a London-based rare book dealer, came into possession of a truly unique manuscript under mysterious circumstances. He acquired it in 1912 from the financially struggling College of Jesuits in Rome. Although the college had intended to sell their book collection to the Vatican, somehow 30 manuscripts, including this enigmatic one, ended up with Voynich. The details of this transaction remain unclear fueling speculation that he may have acquired them in a less than honorable manner. This manuscript, later named the Voynich Manuscript, was unlike anything else Voynich had ever seen. He was captivated by its mysterious language and tantalizing, uncracked secrets. The manuscript drew the attention of brilliant minds, including William Friedman, a master codebreaker known for deciphering the Japanese Purple Cipher during World War II. Despite four decades of effort, even Friedman couldn't crack the manuscript code. After Voynich's death, the manuscript was sold to another dealer, and eventually found its way to Yale University in 1969. Questions about its origins persist, including its suspicion that it might be an elaborate hoax done by Voynich himself. Doubts of forgery once clouded conversations about the Voynich manuscripts, up until carbon dating in 2009 placed its origins squarely in the early 15th century, between 1404 and 1438. The ink and binding methods also align with that era. Although skeptics argue that carbon dating can be manipulated, such as by writing on antique parchment, a complete book like the Voynich Manuscript would be a very unlikely candidate for such deceit. Further discrediting the hoax theory, the book has been documented for centuries. When Wilfred Voynich acquired the manuscript, it came with a letter dated August 19, 1665, from Johannes Marcy, a Prague scientist, to his colleague Athanasius Kircher. The letter stated that the book had once belonged to Emperor Rudolf II, who purchased it for a significant sum, believing it to be a work by the 13th century philosopher Roger Bacon. Though this would clash with the carbon-dated age of the manuscript, the letter itself lends credence to the book's authenticity and long history. The manuscript, often attributed to anonymous origins, continues to perplex scholars and enthusiasts alike. But the prevailing belief today is that it is genuine, not a hoax. 
After its creation in the early 15th century, confirmed through radiocarbon dating, the manuscript passed through various hands in Prague. Among its owners were George Beresh, who noted its mysterious writing and images of herbs and stars, and Jacobi de Tepenek, head of Emperor Rudolf II's botanical gardens. His signature, faint but detectable through multispectral imaging, suggests he may have been drawn to the book's numerous plant illustrations. The manuscript then vanished from the record for 250 years, reappearing in a Jesuit college in Rome, where Wilfred Voynich acquired it in 1912. Athanasius Kircher, a Jesuit and the intended recipient of an accompanying letter dated to 1665, may have facilitated its journey from Prague to Rome. Despite the many theories about its authorship, including a now-debunked association with Roger Bacon, the manuscript remains anonymously written. So, what's hidden inside the Voynich Manuscript? In the enigmatic Voynich Manuscript, the illustrations offer the best clues to its meaning, given that the text remains unreadable. Approximately half of the manuscript is filled with peculiar plant sketches, each accompanied by what appears to be a descriptive annotation. While some drawings faintly resemble familiar flora, like lily pads or sunflowers, most are unidentifiable, presenting fantastical forms that range from the garish to the downright alien. Interestingly, the Voynich manuscript is not unique in its focus on plants. It resembles a long-standing medieval tradition of creating herbals, encyclopedic volumes detailing the world's plant life. These early botanical guides typically outlined a plant's appearance, habitat, and medicinal properties. In an era where plants were the closest thing to medication, herbals were crucial reference guides, identifying plants that could cure everything from headaches to leprosy. Some even featured warnings about poisonous plants, often represented by drawings like that of a snake. Despite its similarities to medieval herbals, the Voynich manuscript stands apart in several key aspects. First, its botanical illustrations are fantastical and almost unrecognizable when compared to the relatively faithful renderings found in typical herbals. Second, the artistic execution of these drawings seems somewhat amateurish. While medieval herbals were often illustrated by professionals, the Voynich manuscript appears to be the work of someone more scientifically inclined than artistically skilled. The manuscript's unique characteristics thus add to its mystery. While the illustrations indicate it might be serving a similar function to other herbals, perhaps describing the properties of each plant, the weirdness in its drawings and execution make it an extraordinary outlier keeping us guessing as to its true nature and purpose. But what follows after the plant is no less strange. Transitioning from botanical illustrations, the Voynich manuscript delves into celestial themes with two sections dedicated to star charts. These are filled with elaborate circular charts. Particularly notable in the astrology section are recognizable zodiac signs like Pisces, Taurus, and Libra, accompanied by depictions of women holding stars and extensive annotations that could indicate constellations. This thematic shift from plants to celestial bodies may be more logical than it initially seems. In medieval times, the relationship between astrology and medicine was deeply intertwined. The timing of treatments, what you took and when you took it, was informed by astrological signs and seasons. In this context, the star charts could serve as an astro-medical guide, prescribing the optimal times for different treatments. For example, during the Leo months, medicines for the stomach, heart and liver are advised, while bloodletting is discouraged. Adding another layer of intrigue, this celestial section contains the manuscript's only legible text. The names of months written beneath each zodiac symbol resemble the Occitan language, once prevalent in southern France. Beneath each zodiac sign is the corresponding month. We have Abaril, Mai, Aust, and Novembre. Can this strange detail point to the manuscript's location of origin? Written between the manuscript's star segments lies an even more peculiar section, filled with miniature illustrations of naked women washing in oversized bathtubs. The enigmatic illustrations grow increasingly strange as the pages are turned, 
revealing curling water pipes and tubes funneling mysterious green liquids operated by the depicted individuals for reasons that remain unclear. Surprisingly, the Voynich manuscript is not alone in its focus on bathing. It joins a tradition of medieval books that explore the topic. For instance, early guidebooks cataloging public baths and hot springs across Italy feature illustrations strikingly similar to those in the manuscript. These baths were each ascribed unique therapeutic properties, aligning well with the health-oriented themes of the manuscript's botanical and astrological sections. This suggests that the bizarre bathing segment may, like its neighbors, be another angle on medieval healthcare practices, delving into the significance of hygiene. Evident from its peculiar illustrations, the Voynich manuscript seems to document unconventional bathing techniques, potentially archaic forms of showers. It then goes back to plant images, but this time, it's different. The focus shifts to the details of roots and herbs, combined with illustrations of weirdly colored cylindrical containers. These objects bear a striking resemblance to alchemic lab equipment, even though alchemy typically concerned itself with precious metals, rather than botanicals. The containers may actually belong to an apothecary's toolkit, aligning with the manuscript's recurring themes of health and medicine. As the Voynich manuscript draws to a close, it presents us with its most puzzling section yet, a series of densely packed, undecipherable text. The margins are decorated with what look like star-shaped bullet points, each adjacent to capitalized letters, giving rise to the theory that this section might be a collection of recipes. But this interpretation, while tempting, remains speculative at best. We are left wondering whether the manuscript's final words could hold the key to understanding something even more profound. While the bright and interesting pictures give us some clues, the real understanding seems to lie in the mysterious writing on its page, a code that even the best experts haven't been able to crack. Is there any way in which we can understand what's been written? Turning our attention away from the visuals to the manuscript's writing, the first thing that stands out is its unique alphabet. It includes some Latin letters and numbers, along with oddly shaped characters. The alphabet appears to consist of 22 distinct characters, although occasional unique symbols can also be found. The Voynich manuscript's text is written in short words, ranging from 2 to 10 letters, and separated by spaces. This text layout is consistent with many European languages, reading from left to right. This leads many to speculate that we're looking at a cipher, a system of substituting letters to mask the original language. Ciphers are commonly used to secure sensitive information, like in the case of the Copial cipher, which mixes Latin and Greek letters along with unique symbols. This particular cipher was used in a book, detailing initiation rituals believed to belong to the secret society of the Oculists. So, what's the method of deciphering this mysterious text? Decoding a cipher often involves understanding the characteristics of the original language. Languages have unique fingerprints. Some prefer longer words, while others have a specific ratio of consonants to vowels. These traits remain identifiable even when the language is obscured through symbolic substitutions. For example, the Copial cipher eventually yielded to description efforts once the original language was identified. With the Voynich manuscript, however, unlocking the secret of the text remains an ongoing challenge. The difficulty in deciphering the Voynich manuscript largely comes from its lack of recognizable linguistic fingerprints. While there is an apparent structure to the text, including repeating patterns and word distributions similar to known languages, the original language, or languages, remain elusive. This patterned uniformity suggests that the text isn't simply random nonsense, but is based on an organized system. Complicating matters is the presence of two distinct languages within the manuscripts identified as language A and language B. These languages appear to correspond to different sections, most notably the bathing and star sections, and potentially different authors. This duality makes the manuscript an even more sophisticated cipher to crack, as not just one, but two languages are at play. 
However, there are analytical approaches to uncovering the underlying language. One of these methods involves examining word frequency and distribution. In English, for example, the word the makes up approximately 7% of all spoken words. Interestingly, the second most common word, of, is used about half as frequently. This pattern tends to be consistent across various languages, and both languages in the Voynich manuscript also adhere to this rule. The frequency of the second most common word in each language is roughly half of that of the most common word, indicating that the text likely functions as a real language. Thus, the Voynich manuscript isn't just a chaotic string of symbols, it shows signs of linguistic structure. But the task of decrypting it is made exponentially harder by the coexistence of two distinct languages. While several individuals have claimed to have decoded or even translated the Voynich manuscript, such claims often prove to be speculative or inconclusive upon scrutiny. A number of theories have been proposed, ranging from it being an elaborate hoax to a lost language, or even a code so sophisticated that it requires a yet-to-be-discovered method to crack. So, the Voynich manuscript presents a paradox. It displays traits of a functional language, but its mechanical spelling patterns and subject-specific keywords defy easy categorization or decryption. It is, in essence, a cipher wrapped in a riddle, shrouded in an enigma, and its code, whatever it may be, continues to elude definitive deciphering. Now, if there is no way to be understood, why was it even written? The suggestion that the Voynich manuscript might be written in a Romance language provides a point of entry into the labyrinthine mystery that the manuscript presents. The appearance of month names in Occitan, a cousin to French, adds a layer of plausibility to this theory. However, as you've rightly pointed out, attempts to definitively prove these theories have largely been unsuccessful. The idea that the manuscript could represent a lost or forgotten language, like the Rongo Rongo glyphs of Easter Island, is intriguing. However, such a claim introduces its own set of complications. In the case of Europe, most languages have been well documented, thanks to extensive historical records. There are language isolates like Basque, but they've been studied and are correctly spoken. A Voynichian language isolate would likely have left other traces, archaeological, historical, or anthropological, that we simply haven't found. The idea that the Voynich manuscript might be a hoax has always lingered in discussions about its origins. The flawlessness of the manuscript, devoid of any corrections or errors, is indeed peculiar. Most handwritten texts from the medieval period contain mistakes. Given that they were copied laboriously by hand, the manuscript's overly mechanical language patterns and the absence of errors could be interpreted as signs of deliberate obfuscation rather than genuine linguistic patterns. Yet, dismissing it as a mere hoax poses its own challenges. Creating a manuscript of this complexity and length would have been an enormous undertaking, especially when considering the sophistication of the illustrations. The effort required to generate a text so consistent in its complexity and so confounding in its cryptography seems almost disproportionate for a mere prank or deception. And if it is a hoax, it's an extraordinarily elaborate one that has stumped some of the best minds for centuries. Until a sort of Rosetta Stone for the Voynich manuscript is discovered, or some other breakthrough occurs, this enigmatic document remains a cipher in the truest sense of the word, a puzzle that tantalizes with glimpses of order and meaning, yet resists all attempts at definitive interpretation. Constructed languages, or conlangs, have their own consistent rules, alphabets, and vocabularies, which could explain the text's seeming regularities and peculiarities. Indeed, constructed languages can be as functional as natural languages, given that they adhere to internal rules and structures. Esperanto and Tolkien's languages like Quenya are excellent examples of how invented languages can develop communities of speakers and become real in a functional sense. If the Voynich manuscript is indeed written in a constructed language, it raises intriguing questions. For what purpose was this language constructed? Religious or mystical texts often employ coded language to obscure their meaning, reserving understanding for the initiated or the enlightened. 
Alternatively, it might have been an academic exercise, an early foray into linguistic theory, or even a tool for confidential communication. If the latter is true, it has certainly proven effective, as the text has resisted all attempts at decryption to date. One of the drawbacks of the constructed language theory is that, while it might explain the text regularities and the absence of errors, the creator knew his or her invented rules flawlessly. It does not explain the manuscript's intricate and scientifically plausible illustrations. If the purpose was solely linguistic experimentation, why include detailed botanical, astrological, and anatomical drawings? Another point to consider is that even constructed languages usually bear some resemblance to natural languages. They often draw on existing grammatical structures, phonemes, or lexicons. Yet the Voynich manuscript defies categorization, adding another layer to the enigma. Many constructed languages were created with the aspiration of becoming the world's first universal language. Often, these were initiated by scholars and intellectuals who hoped to make their work universally comprehensible, overcoming the barriers posed by different native tongues. It's conceivable that the Voynich manuscript was an endeavor in this direction. Given the scientific nature of the book's content, it might have employed an experimental language aimed at reaching a broader readership. If that were the case, its purpose would be opposite to that of a cipher, which is intended to obscure information. Unfortunately, if this theory holds, the language's rules may have been lost to history, rendering it unreadable. However, no theory can claim complete plausibility, and each comes with its own set of challenges. Although constructed languages often display originality, they are almost always influenced by one or more existing languages. For instance, Esperanto amalgamates elements from various European languages, while Tolkien's Kenya draws inspiration from Finnish. If the Voynich manuscript were written in a constructed language, one would expect it to exhibit traces of an existing language or languages. Moreover, given that the manuscript seems to contain two languages, it would likely draw from two existing languages as templates. And then there's the glaring question, why not use Latin? It was, after all, the academic lingua franca of the medieval period. So far, the manuscript's mysterious language remains a riddle without a solution. It's an enigma that continues to defy decryption, and it may well remain that way indefinitely. The Voynich manuscript remains one of history's most enigmatic puzzles. As we delve deeper into the digital age, it stubbornly resists decryption, reminding us that not all secrets yield to modern scrutiny. What is it hiding within its complex illustrations and undeciphered text? Is it a lost language, an arcane scientific text, or perhaps a hoax that has fooled scholars for centuries? In a world where answers are often a click away, the Voynich manuscript stands as a monument to the enduring power of mystery. Will unlocking its secrets make it less attractive, or will it open a doorway to even more profound questions? If you enjoyed this episode, give it a like, subscribe, and watch our related videos on the screen next. Keep your minds open, and until we meet again.